this is a property directory app that I've built using Bubble. I built it as a template, so it is available for purchase in the Bubble Marketplace. I'll put a link to it in the description. And today I'm just gonna go through how I thought about designing this app and some of the design choices I made. The first page we're gonna look at is the index or the homepage here. And if we go into our Bubble Editor, what you can see is there's maybe five main components on this page. First of all, we have the nav bar at the top and the footer at the bottom. Both of these are reusable elements. If you go up to the drop down menu here, you'll see I have a number of reusable elements. I try and use as many reusable elements in my bubble app as possible just to keep everything modular and it just makes it a bit easier to manage. There are two other main components on the page. The first is this kind of filtering area up here where you can choose various criteria for the properties you want to look at. So for example, you'll see here we have properties from New York, Los Angeles, and from San Francisco. So if I go up to location and type in San Francisco, then you'll see that the properties get reduced down to only areas in San Francisco. And I can put in this radius here so I can also put in properties within 50 miles. And you see we get another few places like Menlo Park, which are near San Francisco, but not quite in it. We also have these price criteria. So for example here, if I set the minimum price to being uh, 900,000 and click off that, you'll notice that the last property disappears. And finally, if I set the max price to be 2 million, you'll see the first property, which is most expensive, also disappears. In terms of how these filters work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the editor and just show you now. So what I've essentially done is I've created a number of custom states on the page. And if we go on to index and click on information, you'll see here there's a number of custom states. I like to keep custom states on the index page itself. It just means I know where everything is straight away and it's never going to be removed, the index element itself. So these custom states will exist as long as the index page itself exists. If we take the price as an example, and you can see that the min price by default when the page is loaded is set to zero and the max price is set to this really large number here. So essentially, when the page is loaded, these are the default custom states uh, and all properties are going to be showing because all prices are going to be within that range. Now, what happens is, is that when someone changes one of the inputs, be it the min price or the max price, if you go to our workflow section here, you'll see there's quite a number of workflows going on. Uh, what I have done is I've used folders here just to make it kind of you know easier for me to pick out the various workflows. So I have four workflows here, two for max and two for min. And I'm just gonna focus on the desktop versions first and I'll explain mobile in a second. But if we change the min price, what that's gonna do is gonna set the state the custom state of that min price custom state that was on the index element and it's going to set it to the value in it then if we go back to our editor and we click on the repeating group we will see that i'm using filters to essentially only bring in properties where the price is greater than the min price now a fair question to ask might be why not just use the value in this input box uh, when you're doing your filtering why do you have to go through the other step of using custom states and the reason is, depending on the width of the page, the min price element may be up here, or maybe actually in this drop down here, which is for mobile. So you can see here that this group here, which is for mobile group price, that's only visible when the page width is greater than 850 pixels. So if we go into our responsive view over here, what you'll see is that you know, price is visible there, but when we go down to the smaller screen size, it's still visible. But as we get further down, it drops down into the mobile drop down. So using custom state is just a way to ensure that there's only one source of the min price slash max price. If we actually click on one of the property listings, you'll see we're gonna be brought to the property page and we get this nice clean slug straight away in the URL. But essentially the property page displays the information for this specific property. And you can see here, we have three main images to represent what the property is. We have the price, we have the address, bedrooms, bathrooms, square feet, a description area, and then also we have its location on Google Maps. We can zoom in there, zoom in there and see it a bit closer. The other element on this page is this kind of real estate agent contact details area. You can see the name of the real estate agent that's selling this house is listed, the logo is there. And if we click on contact agent, you get this pop-up. Uh, what this allows you to do is actually contact the real estate agent who posted this property. So if I click send message here, what this is actually going to do is it's going to send an email to the agent behind this property. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show the dashboard. So there's one main user type in 
this app. And it might be a good time just to show the database before we go into the dashboard. It's a very simple database structure. There's only two types. There's property, which contains quite a bit of information on the property itself, things like address, bathrooms, bedrooms, categories, description, and so on. And then it also contains the agent data type, which is a type of user. So if we go into user, what we'll see is that a user uh, has the standard fields, email, modified date, created in slug, and then also agency logo and agency name. So every user is essentially associated with a real estate agency. If a user has registered for accounts, they can sign in using this sign in page here. Before I do that, what you can do is if you want to create a new account, you know, classic kind of standard sign up fields here, put in your logo, put in your email, put in your agent name. But let's just do the demo sign in. And you're brought to this dashboard. So this dashboard basically shows all the property listings that the user currently has. So if we went to profile, you'll see here we have the agency profile photo and the agency name. But I just want to go into the dashboard page here because the setup here, it's designed uh, the dashboard section as a single page application. Uh, I have another video on how to design a single page application. I'll link to that just up above now. But the way this dashboard works is we essentially have one page and then depending what's on in the URL here in terms of the last path segment of it, a different reusable element is shown in the dashboard. So for example, listings is shown and therefore this element here is shown. If we go to add listing, you can see that the last path segment changed and we get a new view where we can actually add a property listing. And similarly, if you put in profile, we get taken to the profile reusable element. So this is the dashboard page here. Uh, what you see is it actually looks as though it's pretty empty when you open it up. It has this sidebar nav here, which I'll talk about in a minute. But apart from that, there's nothing actually showing by default on the page itself. And the reason is, is because I'm using reusable elements and switching between them, what I've actually done is I've hidden all of these views by default. So you'll see there is actually all of these reusable elements that are on the page. But if we go to their layout, you'll see that they're all not visible on page load by default, and they're also collapsed when hidden. And if we look at our drop-down menu here, you can see here are those four views. So view as listening, views edit listing, views listing, and views profile. We might look at the add listing one first of all. It's probably the most interesting. So this is where you're adding a new property listing. It's pretty standard. You have a number of input fields. Um, you can upload images, you create a listing, but there's a couple of things here I just wanted to show in a bit more detail. First of all, the category section here. So if we go to the add listing views, what we'll see is the categories are not static choices. It's a repeating group, first of all. And if we look at each cell, what we're essentially doing is we're getting data from all categories. And all categories are actually uh, an option set that we've created. So if we go back into our database and we look at option sets. You'll see here that we have a number of categories, one, two, three, four. You will notice that on the page only three are showing. The reason only three are showing is because I am having all properties are going to get this all properties category. Uh, just because when we're filtering our choices on the home page, we want all properties to be an option. So I won't go into detail on how this is, you know, works, but at a high level, when a user selects one of these boxes, the category is added to a custom state. And then when they click create listing, that category is added to the property in the database. So just taking one of this example, if we go to all properties, You'll see here that for this one in San Francisco, we have two categories added, and that's where they come from. I did want to show just how the image upload works because this is, took a bit of time to get working, not too difficult, but what I'm going to do here is upload a photo, and you can see here this is actually an uploader element. Just to show this again in the design tab of our bubble editor. You can see here that that is a file uploader image one. That's the name of the uploader that I've created. But I just want to show what's actually happening behind that. So if we go to group photos and we go to group photos again, group image one. 
So there actually is a group here and the file uploader image is over it. So what I'm doing is when I'm uploading a photo, I'm going to run a workflow that's actually going to hide the uploader. Uh, it's going to allow this group to be shown. The image shown in the group is going to be a custom state I've created again. And it's also going to then show this close icon. So I'm going to take it through the workflow and then I'll actually show it in action. So we go to workflow. And if we look at when file uploader image one value is changed, i.e. when something is uploaded, what we're doing is we're setting that custom state and we're giving it the value of the image that's been uploaded. We're hiding the file uploader. We're showing the X icon and then we're resetting the relevant inputs. So again, if we go to click on the uploader and choose a photo to upload, it gets uploaded, the group gets shown, it displays the dynamic image, it hides the file uploader, and then we get this X icon. And then the X icon almost does the same thing in reverse. When the X icon is clicked, we're setting the state of that custom state to blank, hiding the close icon and showing the uploader once again. So that way we can add and delete images as we like. Just one more time, click the second one. Get that there, we can exit. So that's how agents create property listings. Uh, if you go over to the listings view over here, you'll see this is, as you would guess, another repeating group. So what we can do is if we go into views and then it's just views the listings, you'll see that this is another repeating group, like I said, and the way it's filtered is the agent who created the property listing is the current user. So the agent has only seen the listings that they themselves have published. You can edit your listing. So if you click on here, we're brought to the edit listing page and you can change things around. You can, like I said, change the images like that. And once you click save changes, it's essentially going to overwrite the existing data with the new data that's been created. The other thing you can do is, of course, you can delete properties. So if you click on that, you're presented with this pop-up and you can easily delete things. And you can also change details on your profile page. So you can change your logo, you can change your name and save changes pretty easily. The last thing I was going to show was just this sidebar nav here because it is a bit different. If we go back to the dashboard section of our app, you will see that you can't edit it on this page because it is a reusable element. So like I said, I try and use reusable elements wherever I can in my bubble app. Uh, what we've done with this one is if we go into it, I've called it sidebar nav. We have these four buttons here and if we click on one of these buttons and there's more details on this in my video on how to build a single page application it's doing two things it's hiding the sidebar nav only if it's on mobile so i'll just show you how that works quickly in terms of responsiveness if we go over here and we go to more tools go to developer tools Get rid of that. So you can see on mobile, it's fully responsive template. So you'll see when I click this mobile menu here, the menu pops out over it. When I choose one of the options here, let's say add listing, for example, it gets rid of the menu and brings us back to the relevant reusable element. It only gets rid of the element when we're on mobile view. you'll see that it doesn't change when we go between them here. It's only on mobile where we get rid of the menu. And if we go back to our sidebar nav. The other thing that happens when you click on one of these buttons is it goes to the dashboard page and sends in some arbitrary text. And that's effectively how we manage navigating in the single page app. When I click on one of these buttons, it sends this arbitrary text uh, which in this case is going to be listings up into the URL and that shows and hides the various elements on the dashboard depending on what's in the URL. Just to give you a very quick example, if we look at the edit listing view, you can see here that this is only visible when the URL item number two is edit listing. So this is only going to show when edit listing 
is in the URL like that. So that's a very quick overview of my property directory template. Like I said, it's available for purchase in the Bulbary Marketplace. I'll put a link to it in the description. And I hope this was useful in terms of thinking about how to design your own bubble app.